Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to look at the basics of using grids to start making our UI layouts. We are starting with another blank WPF project like before, but this time we are going to focus only on the UI layout portion and more importantly, the grid control. Now, of course, as you can see, there are a lot of controls and I'm not going to be able to go in depth with all of them, but the grid is such an important control that I want to give it a little bit extra focus, especially up front, so you can start building better UIs quicker. So the first thing I want to mention is that the grid is the default control that is set to the Windows content. So if we remove this grid, we could add a text block and we could say text hello and end our text block and you can see that hello shows up there but if we put a second text block under it you'll notice that it's a squiggly line and it says the property content is set more than once and that's because the window can only have one thing set as its content and that's why a grid is created for you by default and all of your other elements can go inside of the grid now that doesn't mean you have to have grid set to the Windows content. You could have any number of other containers, controls, or even a custom control. But for now we're going to go with grid because it's simple and powerful. So next let's talk about the grid's layout definitions. But before we do that, I need to show you another way to access a control's properties. So the first thing that we did was we set a hello world text block and we had it in a single tag and the property lived within that tag. But another way that we could use to access this text property would be to create a text block, open the tag, and then close it in another tag. So in here, which is inside the text block, we could access the text block text property by saying the object.text, just like we would in code. And then within that tag, we would set the value. So this is just the same as doing this. So when we access the grid's layout definitions, we're going to access the properties of that grid in this way. So let's do that now. So a grid has two main layout definitions, row and column. So if we said grid.row definitions, and then within the row definitions, we could add a new row definition. So this element represents a row in our grid. So right now you can see this blue outline represents our whole grid, but this also represents our single row. So if we added a second row definition, you can see now our UI is split into a two row grid and we could keep adding them and it would keep adding rows to our grid. Just like row, we can also access the grid's column definitions and add new column definition. So right now we have a single column, we add another one, we will have two columns and four rows in our layout. Now doing this is not putting anything in the grid, it's just setting the grid up itself. So once we have these definitions defined, we can do things like adding things to our grid. So I'm going to create a rectangle just for the purposes of setting a fill color. So I'm going to just make a red rectangle and it's going to automatically place it in row zero column zero, which is the first element in each, just like an array. Now say I wanted to create a blue rectangle. What's going to happen is it's also going to place it in row zero, column zero, because that is the default. So you can see that the first one I defined is actually going to be behind the second one I defined. So what I would need to do is actually define a row and a column that I would want it in. So just to be clear, this one is actually in grid.row equals zero and grid.column equals zero. You just don't have to define these properties because they are the defaults. So if I put these properties in this one and say change the row to row one, it's going to move blue down to row position one. And if I change it to column one, it will move it over to column one. So row one, column one. Then if I create a third and say make it green, it will be in 1, 1, but I could move it to say 2, 0, and it would put it there. Now by default, a grid is automatically a responsive design because we haven't defined any sort of height or width. Everything is going to stretch to fit. So if we run this, 
Our rectangles will not just be the size of our designer, but they will stretch depending on how the user resizes the window, which can be very useful, but sometimes it's not what you want it to do, so sometimes you actually have to define static properties for some of your grid elements. To give an example, let's take away our column definitions, which we don't need these properties anymore. So now we have rows for red, blue, green. Let's take away this fourth row. So now we have a three row layout. So let's use Visual Studio as our example and let's take a look at its layout. So at the core of its layout, it has a statically sized menu bar and then it has a second row for all of this content. And then it has a very small statically sized footer that says things like ready and add to source control. And if we resize the window, the main menu bar and the footer don't resize, only the content does. So to do that, we would need to set specific heights on our first and our third rows or our rows at positions zero and two. So looking at Visual Studio, let's say that this menu bar is 70 pixels tall. So we'll set our first row's height to 70. Now, this row will always be 70 pixels. You can see it's locked. Then, this next two rows are one star. The star meaning it is going to stretch into its available space, and the one being its proportions. So both of them being one means they're going to stretch equally. So then the bottom, we need it to be static as well. This thing is small, we'll say it's 20. So let's set its height, 20. Now it's 20 and locked. So when we run this, we only have one column that is now no height, which means it's star. So it is going to stretch while the other two rows do not. So now we have the basic layout to match something like Visual Studio. We could put all of our run and stop and debug buttons up here and our footer information down here. And then this blue area would be our content pane. So now I'm going to add a few quick XAML comments, which you do with an open tag, exclamation dash dash, and then to close it is a dash dash close. And I'm going to say this is going to be our menu bar, and then I'm going to copy and paste and copy and paste. I'm going to separate these out. This is going to be our content pane, and this is going to be our footer. So now we can see exactly what our grid elements look like. So now let's focus on our content pane. Looking back at Visual Studio, this content pane is also split into a lot of different elements. So what we can do is instead of having this rectangle at grid row one, we're going to add another grid. So our grid is going to live in the containing grids row one. So this grid.row is the property of this grid. So this grid is actually living at this grids row one which is here. So now the main idea of this grid is a three column layout. The toolbox, the editor slash designer window, and the solution explorer. So what we can do here is we can say grid.column definitions and we can add three columns. So if we look back at this row in Visual Studio and it's three columns, if we resize it, you'll see that the first and the third columns do not resize when it's stretched. Only the middle one does. But, so I can give you some different examples, we're going to say that we want them to be this size, but when we resize it, we want them all to stretch in proportion to one another. So if we look at our column definitions, we do not want to set static widths like we had heights on our rows. We want them to be proportional. So what you can do is you can say something star in the width and the number that you add before the star is the proportion of that column or row. Now by default, it is one star and you can add any number you want. So if I say 22, 33, and 44, it's automatically going to do the math and proportion them accordingly. But this is hard to tell actually how big your spaces are going to be. So I recommend that you do something that adds up to either one or 100. So if you like to think of 20% being 0.2 and 60% being 0.6 and another 20% being 0.2, then we have a full one being 100%. Or you could say, I want this to be 20% and this to be 60% 
and this to be 20%. So now we have a better idea, just looking at our numbers, what proportion of the screen they're actually going to take up. I will clarify one thing. If we add another column here, you can see it automatically redid the math for us. But if I change this to say 100, so now this is 100 pixels. Well, you can see that this is no longer going to be, like I said, 100%, this being 20, 60, and 20, but really now this equates to 100% of the remaining available space, because this column was always going to be 100. So this is the space we have left, so this will now take up 20% of that remaining available space to fill. So let's go ahead and remove this column. So now that we have a grid inside of a grid, we can add things to this grid. We could add another rectangle, with a fill of say light gray and it will be in column zero by default. So if we add two more, we could say grid.column one and then grid.column two. And we could change these to say gray and dark gray. And now we have our three columns here. And if we run this, you'll be able to see them resize in proportion to one another. So if I stretch it this way, the menu bar and the footer do not stretch. But if I stretch it this way, you'll see that all three panes stretch in proportion to the proportions that we set. So that's how you can get a layout to be responsive to exactly what you need it to look like. The last thing I want to do is sprinkle just a little bit of reality on this. Because we only have 35 lines of XAML code, this is very manageable, but we would never actually use filled rectangles to populate entire areas. Each one of these areas, if you just look at Visual Studio as our example, are incredibly complex controls. They have controls within them, and those controls probably have controls within them. So for something like the content pane, we'd need to be able to swap it out based on if we're in a XAML file, or if we're in a code file. So things like that need to be structured well. So we would want this to be in its own file, maybe called a content pane custom control that we can create multiples of, swap them in and out, and only reference them in the main window. And if you do that, if you make your UI modular, then it becomes a lot easier to just pop into a control and modify it rather than trying to dig through thousands and thousands of lines of XAML code trying to find what you need. So next up, we are going to learn how to create custom user controls and use them in our UIs. So thanks for watching, everybody. I do appreciate you. Hopefully this is helpful. Please feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Happy coding, and as always, until next time, take care.